I'm going to talk really about optimization in a more general sense, not just about specifically how to optimize a website. And the clue to this is in the picture in the background there, because really where you get the biggest hit in optimization is by mixing technology with creativity. And it's combining those two things, throwing those th two things together in the right way that, that makes the biggest difference. And, and we've noticed um, something very interesting at the start of this year. We've noticed our customers, our clients, asking very different questions of us, and they're thinking about things in a very different way. Um, so what we've been doing over the last few months is doing quite a lot of research of um, customer behavior. We've been researching uh, that for our own clients. We've been talking to our clients. We've been talking to people in the industry. We've spent a lot of time talking to the likes of Adobe, Google, Twitter, to really try and understand how, how these different types of questions that we're getting, what are the implications of them? And that's really what I want to share with you today. So I'm going to start with my favorite ever tweet. This is Lionel Richie's uh, first tweet when he came on Twitter. Um, it's actually not Lionel Richie. It was a, a Lionel Richie look-alike, but, uh, but I think it's still quite amusing. What, what I want to talk about today is, is four things, really. The pace of change, and this will back up some of the stuff that we've seen before. Hopefully, it won't overlap it at all. Um, but um, you know, it's about how consumers are changing, and then also then looking at how brands are changing as well and how agencies are changing and how they're working together to address the ever, uh, increasing user needs. I want to show you some examples, and these are not necessarily just examples of optimization. They're examples of where technology and creativity come together to, to do something quite interesting. And lastly, I want to leave you with some takeouts. So first of all, um, it's getting faster. We all know that. Um, and I've got some good examples here which show in a slightly different way how people are changing and how technology is driving that. This is uh, an age verification form for uh, my crisis. Um, you know, rather than asking people how old they are, you know, who, who recognizes that thing on, on, on the left there? Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting one. I, I don't know what the conversion rate was on this particular form, but it, it was probably quite good. Um, this is a brand called Vice. They uh, started out a few years ago as a network, well, started out as a magazine, um, looking at sort of emerging culture and trends, and they've now become a, uh, a sort of global network of brands. What's interesting is that they got their first, they took 10 years to get their first million users, their first million subscribers. They got their next 10 million users in just 10 months. And that's just a really good visualization of how digital channels can really transform a business. Um, I went to a talk at Adobe. Some of you will have seen this if you were at the Adobe Summit. Uh, the CMO of Unicredit, which is Italy's largest bank, making a very interesting statement to his board. We're no longer a bank, we're a website. And that's because almost all of their transactions are now coming through digital channels. And, and, and they need to think very differently and behave very differently in order to address those needs. Um, there was also, a, a, at the summit, there was also a very interesting talk from the, uh, uh, Phil Fernley from the BBC, talking about how um, content is being consumed very differently now. So in 2010 at the Winter Olympics, the iPad wasn't available. And yet by 2012 in the Summer Olympics, it was the single most popular device for watching content. So you know, how does a brand in, in, in a very short space of time cater for something that they don't even know about or isn't even on the agenda yet? This kind of summarizes some of the stuff we've seen about mobile trends and mobile shifts. And, and there's, a, there's a myth that's, that uh, I would say last year many of our clients were saying is looking at web stats, people aren't buying on mobile devices. Why is it important? Well, the reason people aren't buying on mobile devices is predominantly because the user experience is crap on mobile devices for many sites. If you fix that, you know, you're addressing the fundamental need. And we're starting to see that happen now. And that's one of the big shifts we've seen with our clients that they're, they're really starting to up the ante in terms of their desire to, to deliver good experiences on mobile. Um, I think this is best summed up by Marks & Spencers. I don't know if anyone here is from Marks & Spencers, but I, I heard the, the, uh, the head of e-commerce from Marks & Spencers talk the other day. Um, very interesting talk. They were talking about the value of customers in terms of online revenue that they get from customers who buy just through the website through the desktop version of the website versus customers who buy across two or more channels, so buying on tablets, on smartphones. I don't know if anyone uh, can guess what the difference is in, in, in sales per annum. So customer A buys just on the website. Customer B buys across the website, uh, tablets, and smartphones. 
Any idea how much more customer B spends per annum online? Three times. Three times. Eight times. Eight times the annual spend. And, and, and that's not a small segment of customers. It's, it's more than 25% of their customers now buy across more than one device as well. Um, this, for me, highlights, though, the, the real pace of change. I don't know if any of you saw this the other day. Uh, on the App Store, 50 billion downloads. I mean, that's just absolutely sort of mind-blowing. And, and, and if, if you were trying to buy or download an app in that time frame, you were watching this ticker going over. It's, it's just mind-boggling. It's uh, uh, going uh, You can't even see the... Uh, the hundreds, let alone the, the tens or the, uh, the units uh, ticking over. Um, I heard this very interesting guy talk the other day called Peter Hinson, and, and I strongly recommend you have a look at his book. It's called The New Normal. Um, he was talking about this, this pace of change and where things are going, and it's all a bit scary because it appears to be going at this exponential rate. So how, how, how can any of us keep up? Is it just going to keep on going? What's going to happen next? Um, and he, he made the analogy about Elvis. When, when Elvis Presley died, there were 27,000 um, Elvis impersonators in the US. By the year 2000, there were well over a million Elvis impersonators. So by now, everyone in the world should be an Elvis impersonator, <laughs> which I actually think would be a really good idea. But, uh, um, so so P P Peter Hinson made this, this interesting statement. He, he maintains that actually it's not going to change exponentially because what happens... As, as things change, consumers keep up, and to what yesterday was new now is the normal for us. So that's kind of the subject of his book, and he's saying that consumers are now in the middle of this S-curve. To them, it's normal, and um, they're up with it. They're up with the trend. That, you, know, you look at the adoption, you look at some of the stuff presented by, uh, by, by Forrester earlier. Um, but what's driving this change is a small number of, of uh, predominantly a small number of technology companies, companies like uh, Google, like Apple. They're really driving the change because they're enabling consumers and providing technology that enables the consumers to perform in very different ways. And what's interesting is that uh, brands are struggling to keep up. You know, it's, it's, we are all reacting. Brands and agencies, we're reacting to what's happening and trying to keep up. Um, what was very interesting, on, on Tuesday I went to a talk at Google and the uh, president of Google Enterprises made a statement which I, I at the time, I, I thought that's a load of nonsense. But then when you realize that this is where Google are, this is what Google's thoughts are. We all know about mobile first. I'm, I'm assuming you're all familiar with that phrase, mobile first. It's about realizing that mobile is becoming the predominant platform for many customers now and therefore it's the thing that we need to really concentrate on. Um, Google's philosophy now is not about mobile first. It's about mobile only. Mobile is the only platform that matters, the only thing that matters. Now, that's a bit sort of weird and a bit scary, but his rationale is, and, and you can see this when you look at uh, the evolution of, uh, and, and the launch recently of Google Glass and, 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 and all of this talk about wearable computing, is that mobile devices, and I take on board the point that sometimes that doesn't necessarily include tablets, but mobile devices, they know who we are. They know who our friends are. They know where we've been. They know where we're going next. In order to optimize, in order to provide optimization, you need to be able to predict. And what better platform to be able to predict user behavior and to be able to deliver experiences which, which are optimized to that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about brands, what they're thinking. And um, some of this is based on, on, on some recent research that's been done. So this was uh, the Adobe consultancy survey that came out earlier in the year. And there's a real shift in brands' minds, this survey was uh, conducted um, uh, amongst marketing professionals in Europe, but about 70% of those in the UK. Um, and there's a real shift in brands' minds away from paid channels, uh, expecting to spend less on paid channels and much more on owned media, on content. Interestingly, also product and service innovation um, is, is, is right up there. Um, and when these marketeers were asked what the single most opportunity this year is, of course, marketing's up there. They're marketing people. Uh, but, but, but themes like content, optimization, personalization, these themes are starting to, uh, to, to, to really dominate. And um, looking at things last year versus this year, tracking the change, for me, the really interesting thing is that targeting and personalization has come from not really being on anyone's agenda as, a, as an opportunity. I think that's because it, it's difficult to do. Um, but it wasn't really on anyone's agenda then. This year, it's 
35% of, of marketers thinking about targeting of personalization as being a significant opportunity for them, or rather the most important opportunity. Um, content marketing has more, nearly doubled. Marketing automation has more than doubled. Um, there's a really good case study um, which summarizes this up from, uh, uh, from Maria Jones at, at TUI about uh, Thompson, and they've been doing a lot of multivariate testing on their site, and um, they are getting re really good results, and we see this across all of our brands, all of our clients as well, getting really good results from optimizing the experience, from making the experience better, from uh, improving things like forms in the funnel. All of that is important. That'll get you anywhere between a 5% increase and even as much as a 100% increase in performance, which is not to be sniffed at. It's really important. But the thing that gets you the biggest improvement in conversion is personalization. If you can provide personalized content to users, that's where you get five to eight times and, 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 and for some clients even an order of magnitude greater in terms of, uh, of conversion. In order to do that though, we need data. And, and, and this is a, um, a statement that's been attributed to pretty much everyone. Uh, I think I traced it back to Edward Denning, uh, an American statistician. But data is really important in this. I'm going to do a little experiment. Um, I'd like you all to demonstrate now to me how you would open this little sachet of sugar. Can you all show me the hand movement that you would use to open this sachet of sugar? Someone's got it. Someone's got it there. Okay, if you ask people the question, how to open a bag, the first thing people do is they shake it. Okay, you don't go like that. And, and I know it might sound like a silly experiment, but asking people questions, you don't always get the right answer. So um, there's, there's a really good link between town planning and website user experience. When you have a hypothesis and you build something for that <laughs> hypothesis, if you're wrong, you can quite easily see in town planning where people bypass the cycle path. And that's got a very useful parallel with... with uh, technologies like ClickTel that we use across a number of our clients to actually see what, what users are doing. And I think that's an important thing that the clients and customers need the technology to be able to do that. Adobe spoke at, at the summit a lot about this 300 millisecond. It was, it was a big theme there. It's a third of a second. That's the time that you've got when someone lands on your site to be able to work out who they are, where they've come from, and to match them with content that is relevant and targeted to them. And that, that, that requires quite a lot of sophisticated technology, quite a lot of uh, uh, setup and, and uh, setup of creative. There's a lot of things that need to happen in that time. And that's, that's a very difficult challenge. And interestingly, this back to this survey again, um, only 11% of marketing decisions are based on data in, in, uh, across these marketeers. So that's that's a little bit worrying. That means there's a, a big opportunity still to come. But also worryingly, only 18% of clients have got the technology to succeed. When we're looking at um, why people don't succeed, it's, or why people think they can't succeed in this area, it's not just about technology. It's about things like time, resources, skills, knowledge, etc. So these are the things that are likely to hold people back. Ultimately, though, to, to, to personalize content means you need to produce more content, and it still needs to be creative. So there's a challenge to produce more stuff more quickly, and it still needs to be creative. That doesn't mean that you, need, you don't need stuff that isn't perhaps so creative, that's more automated, that's produced very quickly. It also doesn't mean that conventional advertising, there is no role for that. There is still a role for um, uh, highly crafted, less personalized creative work. Um, a really good example that you've probably all seen during the Super Bowl this year, um, the, the tweet that Oreo put out um, and, uh, you know, when the lights went out. And that's a really good example of a brand that's geared up to produce content really quickly. And there's quite a lot of things you have to do to be geared up there. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how many of you work in financial services, but that's an industry that is quite difficult has in it to get things passed through several rounds of compliance. Imagine if this was a financial service brand, how many different levels and people that you might have to go through to get approval to get a bit of content published on a platform like Twitter um, in, in real time. Um, and uh, there's a very interesting comedian called David Schneider who was talking the other day at Twitter about how you do things like that. And he, he, he's got a company called thatlot.co.uk, which you should all look at again. 
That's a, a company that's basically comedians who are also experts in social media, and they advise brands on how to tweet, how to use, what tone of voice to use in, in, in social media. And he likens uh, his approach to surfing. It's, it's you kn knowing when to jump on that wave, when to catch the wave. If you catch it too early, whatever your message is will have no impact. If you catch it just at the right time, just as things are building up, um, then you'll, you, you'll get the biggest hit. I love this graph. <laughs> My favorite pie chart. Um, what it's there to, wait till you see the next one. Po apologies in advance. Um, this is there to illustrate uh, a, a point that um, there is a, a real skills gap that, uh, that, that is out there in the industry at the moment. And that's a skills gap in clients and it's a skills gap in agencies. And it's about analytics. And it's not just people who can crunch through big chunks of data. It's about people who can take data and deliver meaningful um, insights out of that data. And that, that's what, what we found in talking to, talking to clients out there, talking to consultancies, talking to other agencies. This is one of the next big things. It's there already. It's a demand that is untapped, unfulfilled. If I, I have got children, I've got four of them. They're a bit young. But if they were going through up to university stage at this time, I'd all be trying to advise them to become an analyst. Here's the picture I apologize for. This is, uh, um, this is uh, to represent back-end technologies. And um, <laughs> the first picture that came up when I typed in back-end technology, I didn't have my Google Safe search on, so I can't show that. Um, back-end technology is, is, is really important. It's, um, it, it's about having the right underpinning technology that enables you to, to, to deliver personalization. Um, it's about having technology that enables you to link data, uh, to, to look at big data really quickly in real time and to deliver those personalized experiences online. Again, that's something that we are seeing really in demand. Our, our clients are, many of them, most of them, either in the process of replatform or working out how to replatform, how to get better underlying technology. And there's a real shortage of businesses and consultancies that can help them do that. And lastly, um, organizational structure, it was touched on earlier. Um, in order to personalize content, in order to provide lots of different versions of content, different experiences, requires a very different structure to your organization. And there's a shortage of people who can help clients, brands do that. And again, that, 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 that's something that's really important. Um, you've probably heard a lot of talk about innovation, innovation culture. That, that's a big thing, and it's very, very important. And if you ask me, that's one of the single most important things that's going to differentiate between businesses that are still here in five years' time and businesses that, that, that have, on that S-curve, have failed to keep up with consumers. How quickly can we adapt? How quickly can we innovate? And that's not just in terms of, as you saw earlier on the, on the graph about marketing intentions, not just in terms of producing content, producing lots more content, but it's also in terms of things like product development as well. And, and, and lastly in this section, um, agencies realize that they have to change. They have to become much more of a strategic partner, much more of a consultancy as well. So I'm now going to show you some good stuff. Um, this is um, maybe not some of the stuff you might have been expecting, but this is stuff that's interesting and relevant. It's about content and how content can change things very quickly. So this is um, Michelle Fan. She's um, uh, a young girl in America. She set up a, a YouTube channel a couple of years ago, um, blogging from her bedroom, producing video tutorials from her bedroom on how to uh, apply makeup. She's now got nearly 4 million subscribers, and she's had over 700 million views. She's the most influential person in the world on the subject of makeup. Every brand is out there trying to you know, get her to be their brand ambassador. And that's something that's come from nothing to something very significant that's got a major impact in, in a very short space of time. Um, you've all heard of uh, Halo and other similar taxi, taxi apps. This, this is a really interesting development. It's very early days. I have no idea whether it will work. It sounds a bit dangerous to me. But Halo works brilliantly in, in, in cities where there's lots of taxis. If you're out in the country, it doesn't work so well because no taxis uh, are going to come to you. So this, this is basically turning uh, other people, normal people, into taxi drivers. So imagine your, your, your kids are at someone's party and you could use this app or they could use this app. But importantly, the person that's going to pick them up isn't a taxi driver, but it might be a friend of theirs as mum or aunt or older brother or sister. It's, 
It's, uh, it's different from Halo in a number of ways because of that, but also it's much more visual. You can see more about the person who's going to pick you up. Sounds a bit dangerous, I know, but it's, you know, it's kind of something that's piggybacking on a technology on a platform that already exists that wasn't there two years ago, and this has now sprung up out of nowhere. I think you know, the, the, the rise of startups and, and how quickly they can evolve into mainstream uh, apps is, is interesting. This is uh, one, of, one of my favorite websites. It's one of the few websites in the UK that I know of that, that is, uh, I think it's kind of leading the field in terms of a proper responsive website design for an e-commerce site. There are still the vast majority of mobile uh, e-commerce, so the vast majority of e-commerce sites are either not mobile optimized or they have a separate mobile site. Um, Curry's have done it uh, in a very interesting way. It's fully responsive, which is much more, I, th I think, more long-term uh, thinking um, and uh, sustainable, so it will support any device, any device size. And I think that's an example of a, a big brand doing something well that is one of the brands that definitely wants to keep up with consumers on that S-curve we saw earlier. Um, this is an interesting example of business-to-business -business marketing as well. We all talk about business-to-consumer, and that appears to be, um, uh, appears to be uh, the hot topic at the moment. But business-to-business -business marketing is in a very interesting, uh, very, very interesting uh, state at the moment because businesses are also consumers as well. So um, this is a brand uh, called uh, Novo Nordisk, and they're using this platform called Zengage in, in Scandinavia. They're a medical solutions provider, and the use case is that you have lots of salespeople out on the road, with brochures, showing those brochures to medical staff, trying to sell them equipment, but there's no tracking. We've no, it's expensive to produce these brochures. There's no understanding of what content people, salespeople actually use, they engage with, and no tracking of the end user. And it's a very simple iPad app. They've thrown away the brochures, given all the customers iPad, all the salespeople iPad apps. It's a website that sits behind that that publishes content, but it's got analytics in there. So the brands can see not only what their salespeople are engaging with, but the salespeople can forward the content onto the consumers, and the brand can also start to then get visibility of the end users and what content they engage with as well. Very simple, but it's an interesting case study for B2B. This is uh, something that Tesco's have done recently. This is our endless aisle. It's another kind of digital signage, and what we do is we put one of these in the middle of the toy section, and of course you can pack as many products as you want into one virtual screen. So it, this is how it works, very simple. You just swipe up and down to find a product you're interested in something. They, you can rotate to see what it looks like from behind and from the side. So that, that's, that's an interesting uh, use of technology in a retail space, and, 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 and we see that as being a really important thing. It backs up something that was said earlier about linking uh, technology uh, into, in, into retail spaces as well, and it's not just about mobile. So that's the important thing. Um, this is a, a very good case study of a brand called GHD, a hair product provider, and what they realize is to reduce the dependency on paid media. They wanted to grow their business and start to generate sales uh, directly with end consumers, and they wanted to do that globally. So in order to grow their business, they had to get more traffic to their site and make their site more consumer friendly. It was already very optimized from a conversion point of view as an e-commerce site, but it didn't have any content in there that would drag users in, that would engage users. And they've done a very interesting thing. They worked out what that content had to be. Their epiphany was that uh, customers don't want great hair products, they want great hair. And so they created lots of content around the category of hair, and that's enabled them to make not just engaging content on the site, but also massively reduce their reliance on paid media because the site's much more SEO friendly. And uh, I just want to leave you with a couple of uh, interesting videos. This was something that came out on the Huffington Post channel um, within a day of the Tesco horse meat uh, scandal. Over on the far side, can we blame the Romanians? Right behind the burger and Monsieur Le Boeuf in the middle of the field with Monsieur Le Boeuf putting in a strong run, but right up there with him is lasagna, lasagna, my king of lasagna. What the hell is butte and massive cover up on the near side and looking strong in the middle of the field as becoming a vegan and too many horse nuns. Crusader agency budget cuts starting to fade now, but it's Monsieur Le Boeuf with alongside him, trust me, I'm a cow, and fantastic <laughs> running on the stand side from there, sick everywhere. They're sick everywhere now, heading for the line with Trust Me I'm a Cow, trying to keep up our food chain and have us all back hand up, but it's there sick everywhere and Trust Me I'm a Cow trying to catch him on it. They're sick everywhere, who wins the Queen and his mistakes? That's about S-T-A-K-E, not S-T-E-A-K, with Trust Me I'm a Cow in second. And third was Tesco Cock Up Denial, when he got <laughs>
So what was interesting about that, 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 that content was put together in the space of one hour. Um, so it's that ability, again, to do really creative stuff really quickly. Um, and this is my favorite ad at the moment. This, this uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this. This uh, came out in America, but it didn't come out on TV. It came out uh, on YouTube. Shit my pants. Right here. Shit my pants, you're kidding. You can shit your pants right here. You hear that? I can shit my pants for free. Wow. I just ship my pants. Yeah, ship your pants. Billy, you can ship your pants too. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. <laughs> I just ship my pants. Very convenient. Very convenient. <laughs> I just ship my drawers. I just ship my nighty. I just ship my bed. <laughs> you can't find what you're looking for in the store? We'll find it at Kmart.com right now and ship it to you for free. So that's quite interesting because it's talking about, again, that link between uh, retail space and digital. Um, that got 20 million views in two weeks uh, without any paid media. And that's, you know, people who want to see the content, want to engage with it, not people who are seeing it because it happens to be in a TV break. Um, so lastly, some takeouts. I think the, the main thing I want you to go away with today thinking about is that the key to optimization is personalization. Getting the right message to the right person at the right time. I actually know that guy who I used to know him. If any of you here know him, he's a really nice guy. Um, and there's a need in order to, 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 to get that personalization, to get things working. Um, we need to move away from some of these old school ways of doing things. Not to say they're still wrong and they don't have, they're, they're still not uh, valid and they still don't have a place, but we need to move more to new school thinking. And um, I'll leave this for you to, 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 to read in the takeout, but um, it's really important that we need to adapt. Um, and in order to do that, we need to have more analysts, we need to have better back-end systems, and we need to change, we need to be more innovative. And I'll leave you with my favorite, my second favorite tweet of all time, Lionel Richie's last tweet, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.